Hall is a Matt Easton, L.K. Chen collaboration there, and uh, recreating a rare yet iconic late medieval Italian Arkham sword. Spoiler alert, they knock it out of the park. This L.K. Chen Rebaldo, also known as Sforza, is a oak shop type 19 Arkham sword from the late 14th century and early 15th century. It's one of the most faithful recreation on the current medieval European reproduction sword market. The measurement data and the handling characteristics provided by Matt Eason, the YouTuber, antique sword dealer, and fencing instructor to LK Chen, turns out to be incredibly valuable in the recreation of this unique specimen among late medieval swords. As you can see, it's quite a long play for a medieval army sword, reaching almost 37 inch. You can almost see this as a cavalry sword, yet it's incredibly lightweight and nimble. Yet, its unique pommel being very lightweight not only reduces overall weight, but also plays the point of balance quite forward. So, by no means is this a forward heavy sword. It's actually quite nimble in the blade because of the excellent distal taper. It does well in the rotational velocity. However, it's quite forward balanced, making it a lightweight yet very authoritative cutting oriented sword. And we'll discuss the context this kind of sword was used, but also juxtapose it to a very similar sword from a distant corner of Europe, the Irish gallo glass long swords, and see what kind of common traits they share. But let's first look at the cutting performance. Historically accurate target, four pound pork shoulder, meat with arming cap, very sick textile protection, simulate Danbison. A seemingly unremarkable strike. However, look at this incision. All right. Look at oh, how deep it went. Check this out. And this cutting against the textile protection, you see the linen in there. It's so clean. Look at the wound here. Three inches into the shoulder. Completely obliterated. 100% debilitating blow. Nobody can fight anymore when you have an incision this deep in your body. See, it didn't cost you the arming cap, so the Gambison did its job. But look at the meat here. Look at the meat. There's a deep incision. So it cut into the meat through the arming cap. Even though it didn't cut through, there is still an incision here. You can just uh, look at it. Look at, here. look at how deep it went. This is without getting through the arming cap. So it pushed the arming cap into the wound. So if this was on the battlefield, this person would have an infection. Other than having all this flesh severed, this is the second cut that didn't go through. The arming cap, the inside is intact, but it got pushed into the meat. So this is the first one, very clean cut, right? All the way down to the bone, through the arming cap. This one is the second cut. Way shallower, but still the entry is about two inches deep, and the wound channel is about four inches wide, as you can see here. So, even though it didn't cut through the gambeson, it will push this amount of material into the flesh. So, if this or someone's arm, basically the arm is gone. Okay, there's with medieval level of medicine, there's no way you can heal this or reattach your, your arm gone. This proves that textile protection offers very little protection against thrusting. Even a tip not dedicated for thrusting just runs through with ease. 
You see, in there it wants all this meat. Completely shooting the meat. There's no resistance at all. That went well in. Look at this. Four inches, definitely. You see, lost nice cut of this uh, blade. Oh, I got thrust in there. Yeah. It's the wound channel from the penetration. Yeah. Four inches penetration.
cut the bottom in half. Very fluted and strong plastic. Zero glinting on the edge, still shaven sharp, so very durable. It's quite distinct from other period swords of the late 14th and early 15th century. If you can compare it to this Oak Shop Type 15 long sword here, most of the European swords of that period turned to evolve into a very tapered, very acute kind of blade with considerable amount of thickness. Even though, um, due to the distal taper, it's a lot thinner on the upper portion than the base, usually less than half as thick. But it becomes quite narrow on the upper portion, uh, terminates into a acute point to combat full harness of plate armor. Because cutting is completely ineffective against hardened steel plates, thrusting through the thick and domed plates is also a fool's errand. So most knightly swords of this period turn to combine the cutting potential of longsword to a tapered plate use usually a half sorting stance to pry open the opening of the articulated plates in full harness to jack into the mail armor and the textile protection underneath to wound and kill and combat it. And as you can see here, this type 19 army sword is quite an outlier in that kind of development. It, similar to earlier medieval swords, it has a blade that has very little profile taper. Uh, on glance, you might think that these two edges are parallel, but actually they're not. There's slight amount of profile taper, so at the point of percussion, the ideal cutting portion here, it still retains about 70% of the width of the base. Uh, still, that's uh, quite wide. If you can consider that, just compare it briefly to this cut and thrust long sword here. As you can see, up here, it's a lot broader, yet at the base, it's actually thinner. So, the old shop type 19 arming swords and long swords tend to be the narrowest at the base among all the medieval swords uh, because medieval swords in general tend to be rather wide. They have a variety of tapering resulting in either a broad blade on the upper portion or a narrow blade yet thick to be rigid in thrusting. So undoubtedly if you compare the tips of these two swords, you can see this is much less thrust oriented and that begs the question why they have this kind of swords made in the age of prevalent plate armor. Many of these swords were used in the northern Italian city-states usually by the doge, the duke's personal retinue or by the contract mercenary condottieri who were usually clad in full plate Melanese armor. And that really begs the question, what do you use this kind of sword for? And my speculation is that even though many high-ranking officers, knights, nobles, were clad in full plate armor, whether they are well off or they are impoverished, uh, they can afford some more affordable harnesses, most combatant on the battlefield uh, in this period at least in Italian states, were still protected mostly by textile protections like gambeson, uh, army jackets, or some metal armor. If you look at some of the illustrations from the late 14th century, you can see that many troops employed by the condottieris, the venture captains of mercenary companies, still wore long coats of gambeson. Some of them have a uh, male harbored to protect them. Uh, other parts of the body, such as the limbs, uh, maybe the neck, are not protected by anything at all. Medieval Italian states didn't have centralized army. So the city-states has to spend considerable amount of wealth 
on hiring contract commentary. Most of them dress in textile armor, like gambesons, uh, to fight in formations with pole arms, pipes, poppers, uh, later firearms, and uh, sword and shield. So we know that a forward heavy sword isn't particularly great at fencing because they're not too quick. As the pivot point, the action nodes are so far away from the hilt. Even if you loop your finger across the guard, it's still a little slower at changing directions, deflecting opponent's smoke. However, if you have a large shield like the Rotella, the metal round shield used by Italians at this time, the defense were usually done by the shield. This is very likely to be used by an offhand item, perhaps a Rotella shield or a metal buckler as a defense in the offhand in conjunction. Or it could be used from horseback as a cavalry sword, so it's a multi-purpose cutting sword. Some of the officers may benefit from having a sword long enough to swing from the horseback to deliver devastating cuts. This kind of sword sacrifices a lot of cutting potential by having such a narrow blade on the upper portion. Narrow and sick. If your targets on the battlefield are mostly lightly armored combatants, you can still use a cutting oriented sword. Especially this, if as a side art, and if your primary weapon is a lens, you use from the horseback or a spear or more likely pole axis. Yeah, uh, you have those who combat armored opponents, uh, which were still rare in this age. And uh, most combatants can be dispatched with uh, cutting oriented swords. And if you compare this sword to earlier medieval swords, the most noticeable difference is the width of the blade. So it's a lot narrower, even though it still retains some width on the upper portion, it's a lot narrower if you compare to swords using the age of male armor. However, it's not less proficient in cutting, and it's a lot lighter, so the user can be less fatigued after swinging these for a prolonged period of time. Because the blade has a good mass distribution, it's quite nimble and lightweight, so to achieve this forward balance, you really have to reduce weight from the hilt. And one iconic feature of this kind of sword is having a very simple wheel pommel, usually small in diameter, but even smaller in the thickness. As you can see here, this is a quite thin wheel pommel. Tapers slightly in the center, but not by much. Not having that extra mass, usually falling down some real pummels with a thick central hub. So this reduced the overall weight, of course, making this a uh, even lighter weight sword compared to some earlier long bladed swords like the Type 11 cavalry swords. As you can see here, this Type 11 sword usually used by cavalry forces from the 12th century has very similar proportions to this uh, Melanese army sword, type 19 here. Both have very long blade and very short hilt. And both are quite forward balanced. However, this one weighs a third more than this Melanese army sword. If you want to talk about efficiency, definitely this uh, later period army sword here, definitely is much more technologically advanced. This one features a lot more heft. So it's quite difficult to use this on foot. Uh, this is still very possible, especially if you pair this with a uh, Rotella Rung Shield. The other unique feature is many of these have quillons, straight cross guard, but having some addition on the guard. In the beginning, uh, the late 14th century start to find some of these swords with a finger ring to protect index finger if you want to loop it around the guard and this rip can increase your point position and also make the point of balance a little bit closer to your hand so you have a better control of the sword overall 
And this iconic type of blade also has a feature to accommodate that. It's a recursive about two inches long at the base of the blade. Uh, we sometimes see some stereotypical swords with a castle, but most medieval swords don't have any castle. They have a continuous edge bevel from the base to the edge. So this is quite unique, and I believe this feature was adopted by later swords starting from the early Renaissance to have a castle. So you can loop your finger, sometimes even two fingers, on the castle. Uh, to increase the thrusting accuracy. This feature was found on many side swords, uh, cut and thrust and Renaissance swords, and rapiers. And I believe this is the origin of that design. It has a very complex cross-section across the blade. If you examine it, usually reproductions of the type 19 swords just forego this very complex transition of cross-section on the blade to save cost in the production and public research. And the feature of this blade was taken from a very iconic type 19 arming sword sold by Sasabi in 1979. And Matt Eason was able to provide an accurate measurement of that sword and the handling characteristics to LK Chen and also provide some context of usage. And that results in a very faithful reproduction of this very unique type of sword. Very rarely you can find accurate representation of this transitional cross-section of blade uh, for any budget reproduction. And this sword has a manufacturer suggested retail price of $490 and that place it solidly in the mid-range. The lunch price is at $400. Without a doubt, at this price range, you simply cannot find a more faithful reproduction of a historical piece, especially with this level of fit and finish. The attention to detail is quite stunning, and especially if you compare this to another premium reproduction of this type of sword, the Old Shop Type 19 Longsword, of Irish origin by Stephen Lockwood. And this sword is four times as pricey as this LK Chen example. It's an excellent representation of this kind of sword as well. And you can see by comparing them, the blade length is almost identical, right? So this will be an average longsword blade Yet this will be a very long arming sword, and they share a lot in common. If you look at the hilt, this one has a very lightweight wheel pommel, as we discussed. Very thin, no central hub. And this one has an iconic Irish ring pommel. As you can imagine, this hollow central part can save a lot of mass. So this will be a very lightweight hilt purpose is to, let's say, unbalance the blade, because this is also a very lightweight blade, very nicely display tapered, relatively slender blade for a long sword, and also has that unique cross-section, just not as pronounced as this one. It's a very nimble long sword, lightweight as well, but having this ring pommel makes it a forward balanced one. If you compare these two, you can see point of balance is also very forward. So even though you feel this is quite light and nimble in the hand, it has a lot of cutting authority. These rare blades were mostly found in northern Italian states, such as Milan, Venice. If you go to the Venetian Ducal Palace, you'll see many swords still displayed on the wall featuring this kind of blade, sometimes have even more advanced hilt, have knuckle bows to provide extra protection, and even a notch on the back of the spine um, to prevent the opposing blade from sliding down into the hilt. 
Uh, the other popular place you find this kind of blade is, of course, Ireland. And that's quite unusual because between Italy and Ireland, it's quite a geological gap, space in between. So I believe that this kind of blade was imported to Ireland a lot from Italian makers and fitted by local cutlers with iconic Gaelic hilt components, such as a ring pommel, an S, unique S-shaped guard, sometimes with uh, clover perforation on the hilt, quite Irish in appearance. They usually don't feature the complex hilt components, such as uh, finger loops or uh, side rings, just a simple cross with some unique geometries. And if you look at the blade, it's actually quite similar. At the base, it has a flattened grid castle with a short central footer, just like this Italian sword here. After three inches in length, the grid castle with a footer transition into a hexagonal cross section, just like this one here with fuller. And once the fuller terminates, these two blades on the upper portion just transition into a flattened hexagonal cross section. During this portion, the blade already thins up considerably, so it's quite proficient in cutting with such a thin blade. On the upper portion, it eventually transitions into another cross section. On this one, it's a lenticular cross section, about two or three inches under the tip. So it has actually four different cross sections on the blade. It's quite intricate, quite sophisticated transitions. It's difficult to implement. I believe most of these nail their unique traits. They both feature excellent amount of pistol tapering. This one being a long sword, it's a little bit thicker, slightly wider in the blade, but still comparing to pure long swords, you will see how different they are. So I believe this one over here definitely foregoes the thrusting potential of other pure long swords, favoring cutting by having such a forward balance. It's quite assortative, using by the Irish gallo glass. And you wonder why do these two regions favor this kind of sword? Probably they use the same swordsmiths, at least for the blade components. In Ireland, many of the warfares were waged among clans of lightly armored combatants. Therefore, having greater cutting potentials is still incredibly useful. Perhaps there's some parallel in Italian states. So having cutting oriented swords, at least for certain contingent of the troops, is quite advantageous. You can see on this LK Chen incarnation of the Type 19 sword, not only it features a unique recasso here with a fuller running all the way in, into the hilt, these grooves are quite intricate with decorative patterns and it has an arrow-like crescent following the fuller. The only reproduction company that I know that still faithfully execute this feature is Albion Sword. Some of their Type 19 models, like the Doge, the Kern, the Machiavelli, or the Condottieri, all feature this type of uh, decorative grooves with blackened finish on their blade. So really, kudos to LK Chen for faithfully executing this feature. These grooves are shallow, but yet still they reduce some weight while forming some fluting structure. So making the blade retain its strength, rigidity, while reducing some weight. We have established that this is a very faithful reproduction of this type. How about the fit and finish? LK Chen's usual Chinese sword offerings offer some excellent fit and finish, not just with the sword, but also on the scabbard. And this one inherited that nice tradition. The entire package is quite nice and refined. The blade is completely flat and symmetrical, executes a unique cross-section perfectly, has a strong handmade feel with some minor ripplings, so it's well polished with a satin finish on the sword. It has a singular 
edge bevel from the hexagonal bar section to the edge, no secondary bevel, very refined edge, shaving sharp, so uh, it really fits a seam to cut through infantries with textile armor. You really need very sharp swords with excellent edge geometry to cut through the fabric and still damage the flesh and bone underneath. And both edges are perfectly straight. On the LK Chen Ribaldo, the thickness starts out at 5 millimeters at the base and throughout the Ricasso. It tapers linearly down to 3 millimeters at midpoint, which happens to be the termination of the central fuller and tapers further at a reduced rate down to 2.5 at 2 inches from the tip. Exactly half as thick as the base. Such well executed distal tapering is very rarely present on budget reproductions, priced under $800. This scientific mass distribution results in a very lively blade, despite its width not tapering much in the profile and having quite a long blade. The other benefit is the correct flexibility of the right portions of the blade. It has a nice spring temper. As you can see, it flex only in the last one third of the blade, which is completely accurate. You want the majority of the base to be rigid and only the top portion where you cut the most to be flexible. So if you cut into something with a hard impact and your edge alignment is poor, the sword will vibrate and dissipate that shock, that energy, it will not damage the blade. So, just as usual, LK Chen swords have excellent spring tempering. The blade is made of uh, a Chinese manganese high carbon steel. The chemical composition is quite similar to that of uh, 5160, we are all familiar with, which is one of the best sword steel. It just has about 1 to 2 percent of uh, silicon, so that makes the sword even more durable. The hilt components have a strong handmade feel, they have uh, mostly symmetrical uh, geometries. As we know, these are hand forged from medium carbon steel. The antique originals of these medieval swords also feature lots of minor asymmetries because. They were also hand forged, just like this sword. If you can look at the cross guard, the opening is quite small. It's uh, tailor made to fit this base of the blade, yet on each side, there's a little bit of gap. Well, laterally, there's almost no gap. This is better than perhaps 95% of the, even the premium reproduction swords. It gathered some corrosion on the way to me so as I discussed with KK of LK Chen, I recommend these hill fittings to be heat proof in the future. As LK Chen already does this to a number of their swords, so there's no problem at all on the future batches for these hill fittings. The grip is quite a unique part of this reproduction. I have to give prop to LK Chen swords, as this is their first attempt at making leather wrapped wooden core European style sword strips. As you can see, uh, it's core under wrapped beneath the leather on top of the wooden core. And the geometry of the grip is excellent with some sweating in the center on both planes. The risers are well executed. The core wrap is very even. And KK and LK Chen sent me several messages discussing the choice of leather on this one. They apparently went through a number of premium grade leather and settled on this one for the sword grip wrapping and scabbard wrapping. And I think it's an excellent choice. It feels very nice in the hand. And the core wrap provides enough traction. The leather is slightly soft and supple, so it doesn't mold to the shape of your hand. Uh, I think it's quite comfortable, quite ergonomic, especially with the geometry and shape of the grip. So that really surprised me. And with the scabbard, also has this uh, premium grade leather, cow leather. 
wrapped around a wooden core uh, with a decorative bronze shape in the end is relatively simple, but consider the price range that's very nice, very generous. And just like uh, the previous models offered by LK Chen, uh, historical Chinese sword reproductions, this scabbard is excellent and period correct. It also has a right silhouette. It's not overly thick, not overly heavy, but it has enough retention to the blade. So it sheaths in pretty smoothly, but as you sheaths it, it tucks out nicely for such a long blade. It looks nice with the uh, ox blood leather and this bronze cheek as a contrast. So it's a nice choice. Also feature some grain flap at the end of the pommel. So even though it doesn't feature any locket um, on some premium scabbards, it's very nice for the sword, very protective. Just like the usual LK Chen scabbards. And obviously, as a final verdict, I recommend this sword to any sword enthusiast with some seniority. Obviously, the unique handling characteristics makes this sword a little distinct from the usual medieval sword. So this is probably not the greatest choice as your first medieval sword, just from the handling itself. It handles like a true Type 19 sword, just it's not perfectly representative of the average medieval sword. For that, you probably should get a Type 12 sword, 12, 14, and I sincerely hope LK Chen could work again with experts like Matt Easton for the excellent advice and data. This is definitely one of the best things happening in the reproduction sword market because if you want this rare type of sword to be produced on the reproduction market, your currently your other choice will be LK swords. They offer Karn, Kamotieri, and Machiavelli and the Dolch. Obviously, those are excellent choices, no doubt. But this one has almost finished finish as good. And dare I say, just as tasteful in the historical authenticity department. So, well done, LK Chen and Matt Easton. I'm looking forward to their future collaborations and future models. And I think LK Chen, without a shadow of a doubt, is currently the, the best choice for this kind of uh, venture into uh, European sword production. Thank you for watching. If you find any value or simply entertainment, please like and subscribe. And check out LK Chen's page for the Balinese Rebaldo Army Sword.